In this video, I want to show you how to make beautiful presentations that just involve a lot of mathematics. For example, this is the presentation I gave for my PhD defense. And if I just quickly go through it, you can see that there's just a lot of mathematical formulae. There's a lot of different mathematical images that are involved. Now, if you haven't been following along with my entire playlist on LaTeX, the link to that, by the way, is down in the description. LaTeX is a typesetting language where with a little bit of code, you can just display a whole bunch of beautiful mathematics. But LaTeX has just a lot of advantages for mathematics, and it's not just about being able to display fancy equations. It's been able to create entire documents, or in this case, presentations that have a consistent look and theme and feel to them. So we're really gonna play around with that in this video. Now, don't get me wrong, for many presentations, people will just use something like PowerPoint. And even I do that in a lot of my videos, the, the background graphics are housed in PowerPoint. But when I'm wanting to do something that has a lot of mathematics in it, and I want to have that consistent look and feel that respects the mathematics, then I'm gonna use LaTeX with Beamer. Now, in order to get started, you need to have a LaTeX editor, and that's why I've got to give a quick thank you to the sponsor of today's video, which is Overleaf. Overleaf is a cloud-based LaTeX editor that just has an enormous amount of quality of life features that just make it easier to learn and to develop and to work with LaTeX. Let me start a new project just for us. So I'm gonna come up here and click New Project, and I have a choice. I could choose a blank project, which is what I'm gonna do, but you could also come down to the standard templates and click presentation. And if I do this just very briefly, you'll see that there's a large number of different templates made by a number of organizations. And if you want, you can just go and click on a few of those and find one that you like and edit from there. But I'm gonna show you how to do it from the beginning. So that means a blank project, let's call it Beamer YouTube. Beamer is gonna be the name of the package that we're gonna use and it's gonna create an entirely blank document. A little window organization first. I don't need this left tab right now, so I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna drag things to approximately the middle, and what you'll see is you have the code on the left and then the output on the right, which currently just sort of looks like a normal PDF article because I haven't made it a presentation yet. Okay, so how do I make this a presentation? I go up to the very top where it says document class, and right now it's an article, and you can do many things like books, but in this case, I'm gonna write Beamer here because Beamer represents a presentation. I'm gonna compile that, and what do I get? I get one nice slide. It's LaTeX works by having a major section of the document but between the begin document and the end document. The only thing I have there right now is this make title, which is gonna make this nice title page, and then I have a first section called introduction, which doesn't appear in any way right now, so I'm just gonna delete it. Prior to the begin document is the preamble, that's where I had that document class, and then a few sort of standard things just appear when you start a blank document using Overleaf. And now it's formatted as a slide in a presentation. So let's make another one. To make a slide, I'm gonna go backslash begin, and then I'm actually gonna not use slide, I'm gonna use frame. I'll tell you why in a moment. As I start typing frame, Overleaf pops down the option, I'm gonna hit enter, and it will be give me a sort of pre-formatted begin frame, end frame. And if I recompile that, what I'm gonna get is a second slide appearing. So I have my first slide, which is my title slide, and then I have a second slide appearing down here, which has the title frame title. Let's put some actual content in this slide. So let's do two things. First of all, the title occurs here in squiggly brackets. So I'm gonna change it to something and I'm just gonna be sort of shameless about my, uh, about my sponsor here. So how about let's do overly features or something like this. So then let's put in some content. I'm gonna do backslash begin itemize. It pops up for me and let's do a few items. Okay, so we've seen lists like this before, but let's just very quickly fill in some content. So how about uh, collaboration? Uh, what else is gonna be uh, version, history, and tracking changes. Three different uh, little features of Overleaf here. So let's click compile and see what happens. I do that and now on this second slide I have this little itemized list appearing. That's great, but if I was gonna give a presentation, unlike a static document, I might not want this entire list to appear all at once. I want, might want to appear like one at a time. And this is where the document class Beamer is really gonna come in. So what I wanna do is think of a frame as a collection of content, but a slide is just one of possibly many different instances of the same frame where the different content I'm gonna put in the overall frame may appear on some of the slides, but not others. 
So the way I do this is I'm going to come here and use triangle brackets and I'm going to go starting at slide one onwards and then I'm going to close my triangle brackets. For the second one I'm going to start at slide two and go onwards and for the third one I'm going to start at slide three and go onwards. Now let's see what happens if I do that. Now when I scroll through on the right hand side I have my title page. Then I have this overly features slide with just collaboration, another version of it with collaboration and version history, and a third with collaboration, version history, and tracking changes. Right now this doesn't really appear like a presentation, it just looks like a long list of sort of different slides. And that's totally okay. If I want to come here I can download this PDF. And let's actually open the PDF and now that it's a PDF and open in Adobe, I can just tab along and it just looks like a presentation. I can imagine giving this little presentation in some talk. Let's add some more content that shows up on only some slides of the larger overall frame. To do this, I'm going to use the on slide command. So I'm going to go on slide. And then I only want this to appear on the second slide, so I'm going to do the angle brackets with the two. And then I only do a two opposed to two dash. The two dash would mean two to the end. I want this to only appear on the second slide. And then I'm going to put in the squiggly brackets the thing I want to show, like how about uh, click the clock uh, button because version history you have to click this button that kind of looks a little bit like a clock. And then if I want to do another I could do another on slide, let's do only the third slide. This is going to be associated with tracking changes where you have to click this review button, so let's do that, click the review button. And let's compile and see what this is going to do. So what we get is that on the first slide of the frame, so what we get is that on the first slide of the frame with its collaboration, neither of those texts appears. On the second slide when version history comes down, it says click the clock button. And then on the third slide where I've got tracking changes, it says click the review button. And notice that it's spaced out here, like the, the click the clock button thing, it's like it's there but just not visible. If I didn't want that, if I wanted to really just imagine it wasn't there at all, instead of on slide I could have written only, so let me come in here and do only for these, and only just imagines that it, the rest of it is just even, isn't even there. So the click the clock button and the click the review button, they appear in that same spot, sort of like over top of each other because of the use of only versus on slide. So we've seen how only and on slide can sort of put anything inside of them, special environments like itemize, you can put them right with the items, and there's a few of these so maybe I'll just do, I can do, and another one is alert, and maybe my alert's going to only appear on uh, slide one and it will say uh, alert. An alert is going to be a bright color like red I believe in this particular theme, more about themes coming up. Uh, I can also do something like uh, text uh, BF for boldface here. That'll appear on, I don't know, the second slide and this will be boldface. What does it look like? Remember these were only on the first and second, so on the third slide here you just get normal text, but on the second slide it's boldface, and on the first slide the alert is bright red. So this is a way you can sort of call attention to specific things within the text. Okay, so we're doing pretty good here, but the next thing I really want to do is just make it look a little bit better. When I scroll through this, like, it's okay, it's a fine, but it's a little bit boring, particularly for anyone who's come from PowerPoint where the visuals are just one of the strengths of something like PowerPoint. You look at this right off the bat and you're just like, okay, it's clear, it's reasonable, but it's just kind of boring. So how do I make it a little bit nicer? The first thing that I'm going to do are just a couple small tweaks and then we'll really get all the fancy colors. I'm going to go up here to document class and I'm going to put some parameters in here. The first parameter I'm going to put in is I want my text to be just a little bit larger. This might also just help you visualize this. So I'm going to go and write 14 point. 14 point is just going to increase from its default which I believe is 11 points and so now everything just looks a little bit bigger. So that's just better. Probably should have done that before I even hit record on this video. Second thing I'm going to do is, look, I'm a YouTuber, I like 16-9 uh, aspect ratio, so I'm going to go aspect ratio equals 16-9, and instead of the 4x3 squares that it defaults to, now it's 16-9. So if I wanted to use this in YouTube, it would be set up to go, or you can leave it as default. Now, the next two things I'm going to do are the things that really make the big difference. I'm going to copy and paste something here, two different elements to it. The first is use a theme which I've chosen as Copenhagen and use a color theme which I've chosen as beaver. Uh, more about the city and the animal in a moment. Notice what happens though when I compile. As soon as I've done it, now 
a whole bunch of things has changed all at once. There's some new color coding, there's some new shading, some bars at the top. Down at the bottom I have my name and the title appearing in this bottom bar. There's just a lot of nicer things going on right now. And what I put in here is Overleaf's reference guide. I'll put that in the description as well so you can check it out. But what you'll see on this website is that there are so many different possible themes looks and styles for your Beamer presentations. And the way this is basically organized is the different color palettes are along the top, which are animal names, default beaver, beetle, seahorse, and wolverine, kind of funny. And then city names are the different styles. So if we scroll down, we can go through here. And the one I happened to choose was the Copenhagen beaver theme, and that's why it looks like this. But if I, for example, comment out the fact that I'm gonna use the beaver theme and I compile instead, I'll get that blue and black, which was that default one, which, I don't know, looks pretty cool. Two other things that I'm gonna change at this time. The first is that you'll notice there's always this bar of fancy buttons along the bottom. I've opened my PDF up in Adobe and you'll notice that on all these slides, there's this row of sort of weird buttons at the bottom. These are navigation buttons and they're nice to have maybe, or maybe you don't wanna bother with them. So if you want to get rid of those, then use this set beamer template navigation symbols and then leave it as blank and that's gonna get rid of all of those ones. I don't know, I just sort of don't like them myself and so I think it just looks a little bit cleaner not to have them so I always get rid of those. And then the other thing that I very commonly are gonna add is I set my Beamer covered, another parameter of my document class Beamer, to transparent. And what this does is it lets me see, and what this does is it lets me see what's coming up even though it's not fully displayed. So for example, on this first slide of my first frame here, the version history and the tracking changes isn't there yet, but nevertheless, it's gonna appear here in the sort of transparent format. As I go through, then the second one appears and it remains there. So it's sort of up to you whether you want people to be able to see ahead of your presentation or not. I'm actually gonna leave it on now for the rest of my presentation, just so that it's a little easier for you to see what is there and what is not. Don't want it, just take this line out. Let's do a new frame with new types of content. So I'm gonna go to the end frame that I was at before and I'm gonna start a brand new frame. I've copy and pasted it and let's just see what it is first and then we can go and talk about it. This frame is all about special environments, remarks, examples, theorems, proofs. We've seen these types of things previously in my LaTeX series and they work more or less the same way. It's just that they're compatible with the slide notation that we're now talking about. So how I did this was I had a begin frame and an end frame and I gave it a title, which is special environments. The most standard one, if you just wanna emphasize something, is just a block. A block is no fancy code and you just put whatever you want on it. So in this case, so in this case, the title of my block is remark and then over here it shows up as remark with some text being whatever you want it. And then there's the fancy ones that sort of do specific things. So for example, with example, kind of funny, with example, I don't even need to give it a title because if you do a beginning example, it knows it's gonna be an example and it's gonna give it the title of example. Same thing with a theorem. It would just tell me that it was a theorem regardless of whether or not I said it. If, however, I put in square brackets the parameter, parameter Pythagoras, it's gonna say that this theorem is the Pythagorean theorem. And then you put in, you know, whatever it is that you wish to have. Same story with begin proof and end proof. Notice what it has. It has a few little special elements, like for example, the QED square that it puts on the right-hand side. So these are sort of pre-programmed environments that you can sort of leverage very easily in the middle of your presentation. And then how do I make it work in the context of a presentation? Well, you'll notice that the only thing I've done here that changes when it's gonna be displayed is the proof, that's the part that was hidden at the beginning on the first slide of the frame and then appeared on the second slide of the frame. Well, I just came here and I put the same kind of formatting that I've done before. I did the angle brackets, I put the two inside of it, and yeah, it only appears on the second slide of this particular frame. Easy peasy. I'll begin another frame here and I'm gonna call it a two column frame. So I'm gonna show you how to make columns inside of your slides. Again, we've done a little bit of this before, but I, I want to show you it specifically in the context of Beamer. For the content itself, I'll go backslash begin. Columns is the thing that I want to do. I'll hit enter so that it auto completes it. And I want to give two different columns. For the first column, I'm going to come here and in squiggly brackets, write its width. And I'm going to write this a fraction of the total text width. So I'm going to do 0.5 text width. And that's going to make a column that is 
half the width of my text. Then I'm gonna do another one, which is gonna be the other half, so 0.5 uh, text width. And let's put in some generic text into this. So this is going to be my first column. And I wanna have just a bunch of text, so I'm just gonna come here and copy and paste it just a couple times. Likewise, for the second one, this is gonna be my second column, and let's just copy that a few times just to make it look dramatic. Compile, and let's see what we get. Now I have my frame nicely organized into these two different columns. And this is just really good depending on what you're trying to put in here. So like, I'm gonna actually just come and copy and paste just a couple of the code from my uh, uh, thesis defense here. It doesn't matter about the code, we've broken all of that down before. Well then, now I get this really nice frame with this interesting image over here. This is a Tixie image. I've done a video on how to make those. This is just an interesting um, matrix of mathematical symbols. I've shown you how to do all of that. But now I have my fancy math just really nicely appearing. Okay, that was great, but now I really wanna show you how to make a table of contents for a longer presentation. So I think what I'm gonna do here is just make a couple extra frames. So, not frame, a begin frame. And let's just call this uh, extra frame one, and maybe I'll just make a couple of these. I'll make an extra frame two here. And so now I've just added a few more frames. And the reason for this is just so that I can break this up into different sections. So let's scroll all the way through our thing and try to think about what the different sections that I might want to put on a title page are gonna be. So if I scroll all the way back to the beginning, let's do this, let's make a section. And the very first one was sort of on Overleaf. I was kind of, you know, plugging the sponsor for this video. Then we do some math. So I'll come here and make another section called math. And then we go to these sort of dummy ones that I've made down here and let's make a third section and I'll call this section dummy. Now, if I click compile, the number of slides hasn't changed. The, the fact that I've added these sections doesn't do much, but you'll notice that up at the top of every single one of these slides, those three sections appear. And this can be useful, for example, if I wanna skip right to math, I can click on that. And that sort of navigational bar at the top allows me to jump around through my slide. This is okay, but if you have a lot of different sections, it can get cumbersome pretty quickly. And so you might just wanna turn it off. This is a feature of the specific Copenhagen theme that I have. So one option for turning it off was just to use a different theme. If you still like Copenhagen and nevertheless want to get rid of this, you can use this command, the set beamer template, that specifies the headline to be blank, kind of like how we set the navigation symbols to be blank. If I do that, it adjusts the current theme that I have and gets rid of those. So I've added sections, which introduced the section navigation bars at the top and then I got rid of them. So now I'm back to not having any particular use for the sections. That's why I want a title page. There's actually one other spot it does appear. If I click this button on the left, I like this about Overleaf a lot, You'll notice that in the file here, it would keep track of all of my sections. This is a great way for me to easily jump around in my own code. It's, it's a quality of life feature of LaTeX. Same thing, if I had multiple different tech files, they would all be up on the left here as well. So that's the one other place this is gonna appear. So now I need to make a title page so it appears in the presentation, not just an overlay. There's my begin document, then I have my mic title, and then I'm gonna want to have my frame, which is my title frame. So it starts the same way that it normally does. I'm gonna have a frame and I'm gonna call this the title page. And then I'm gonna have an end frame as well. And then the thing to put inside of there that makes the table of contents is, shockingly enough, table of contents. So backslash table of contents. I click compile and now let's scroll up to the beginning of my presentation. And there it is. I have this title page with these three different sections. These are all links. So if you're in the middle of your presentation, you can always go, for example, to the dummy and this goes down to these dummy frames that we stuck down at the end. Or if I wanna go up to the math section, I can start seeing some of those. Scrolling down here, you can have subsections and sub subsections. So I'll do a subsection, let's call this a dummy subsection. This is gonna slightly change the organizational structure, but from the presentation perspective, the only thing it places it is that up here in the title page, there's the section dummy and the subsection dummy subsection. So I've given you most of the tools to do the presentation itself, but I'm a big believer in having handouts with my presentation so that people are able to read what I've got as well. 
And so I'm gonna come up here and show you how to do handouts. In the parameters for the document class, I'm gonna also add a handout. And then I should specify some characteristics of this handout, so I have to copy and paste some code here. The thing I'm going to do to make this all work is something called PGF pages. And then I'm gonna set the layout for that PGF pages by the command PGF pages use layout. It's gonna be four on one. You could also do two on one here. Four on one is gonna specify four different frames per page, four different slides per page rather. And then if I click compile here, I set what kind of paper it is. I've talked about the border and how it's gonna look. As I scroll through here, now I get these nice documents where I've got four different slides on a single piece of paper, single piece of A4 paper. You can use this to then print it out and it just prints it out in a more efficient way. Don't like it, comment it out and we're just right back to where we were at the beginning. Okay, so we've been editing for quite a while now. We've done a lot of work on our presentation and suppose we realize that we really screwed up and that we actually have accidentally deleted something that we've done a while back. So I wanna show you this really, really, really life-saving feature in Overleap, which is the history button. If I come up here to the history button, then I can go back, you know, right now it's just about four o'clock, but I've been doing this for about 40 minutes now, probably cut it down a little bit so it's shorter for you. And I can go back, how let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's just see what this one looks like. That was our very first thing before we started adding any content. And as I click through the different versions, it gets longer and longer and longer until we get all the way back to what we were just talking about. And I can compare my versions and this is just really nice for making sure that you haven't really lost anything. Once I'm happy, I probably wanna share it with some collaborators. So I'm gonna come up and click the share button here and I can share either via link or via an email address with any collaborators who can come along and work with me and leave comments and track changes on the document. So this is one of the reasons why I really like using Overleaf specifically as a LaTeX editor while I'm making my presentations or anything else I might be doing in LaTeX. So again, thank you to Overleaf for sponsoring today's video. And that brings us to the end. So please, if you have any questions or thoughts about LaTeX and Beamer, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.